Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Mother's Day. And I'm going to talk about that using Proverbs 31, but not hopefully in the way you, you think. Um, I'm going to open in prayer and then we'll start. Dear Jesus, we, we thank you for this day and every day. We thank you, Lord, that you're allowing us to, uh, in this crazy world, still hear the word of God still meet together, even though it's through Zoom. We thank you, Jesus, for all your provisions. And Lord, I pray this day that um, we become people of valor, all of us, dear Jesus. I pray in the holy name of God. Amen. Well, I was really struggling. as I, I just wasn't getting anything for today. And then this morning, of all times, my husband said, why don't you just... Um, Pray into Proverbs 31. Um, so I'm going to read it. And actually, it made me, I'll be honest with you, a little uncomfortable. Um, it seems a little h hard to reach. And so I did a little research on it, but I didn't do as much as you might want to do. Um, and I do want to say, for some women, this is a very joyous day. For some women... It's a heartache day. And so keeping that in mind, um, when we read Proverbs 31, we're going to look at it a little differently so that nobody feels left out. Nobody feels hurt. Nobody feels, you know, I, I never had children or I, I failed as a mother or th those kind of things. We're going to look at how to change that view of Proverbs 31. So I'm going to start reading on verse 10, and then we'll, I'll comment on it after. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies? The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while is he at night and provides food for her household and a portion for her handmaidens. She considers a field and buys it, and from her profit she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and, and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good, and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. And she makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. And when he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them. Wow, she's amazing. And um, supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But this is the most important, I think, verse of the whole thing. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. That's what we want to focus on. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. When I was reading it, I thought it was the church. I thought all those things, I don't know who could accomplish those, but the church being the bride of Christ. And um, I really hope that's the case. But looking back on this, um, just a little background. I, I found some information by Rachel Held Evans. And um, she had mentioned that uh, it really bothers her when some pastors read this on Mother's Day. She felt like a lot of women feel left. They feel like they didn't accomplish what was stated. And I can agree with that. It seems very, very um, far-reaching. But, you know, this was not meant to accomplish in a day, a month, a year. It was a lifetime of accomplishments. But even saying that, I know mothers that have struggled that their mothers struggled and their mother's mother struggled. So for them to read this sounds very unlike 
what their lives would appear. Um, so this, this particular passage transcends gender and circumstance. It's not just about women. It's not just about mothers. It's about men. It's about whoever you are, wherever you are. It's about wisdom. It's about us looking at what wisdom is like in action. So when you look at these things, uh, you know, I like the one about um, she extends her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hand to the needy. That's wise. That is wisdom. And I see our church doing that all the time. Um, now, what's interesting, you know, and I know pastors talked more about um, how things are written than I have, but it is a poem. And this, each stanza begins with a Hebrew letter of the alphabet. So it's in alphabetical order. We don't know that by reading it in our Bibles, but that's what it was. And um, it's not a job description. It's not that women should, you know, you have to do these to be a, a, a woman of virtue. It instructs women, and it's not like you have to get married or you have to have children. It's not about that. Actually, it was written by a mother to her son as a kind of a checkoff list when you're looking for a woman, look for some of these values. Um, so it was actually written in a way for men. And this is so like the world. Things get distorted. You know, I'm a teacher, and we give a test, a standardized test, that when it was first given, it was meant to show teachers where they had gaps, where they missed a, a subject area, where they, they should have zoomed in on a content. It wasn't meant to measure school against school, district against district. It was not. But it has turned into that. So the original purpose of the test has changed over time. I believe the same thing about this Proverbs. It was not designed the way it's used today. Um, so it was really designed for men. The mother wrote it for her son. And in the Jewish community, I don't know if they still do it, but it was designed for the man to sing it over his wife, his mother, his sister, whoever it might be during the, um, the Shabbat. Is that how you say that? Shabbat. Shabbat. I'm sorry. Shabbat. And so if you take, if you think about that and, and men sing that over women, it kind of takes me out of the driver's seat. It's not up to me to produce all that. It's just a prayer for me, a song for me. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's not something that we have to look at and say, Oh, I'm going to attain all these things. I'm going to learn how to weave and I'm going to sell my linen. It, it, it's not. Um, the most important thing, I think, is it celebrates valor. And valor means bravery. It means um, courage in the face of danger. It means courage in the face of a battle. And, you know, the women I know are very courageous. The women I know are always fighting in the face of a battle. I can name women in our church that are fighting cancer and they're fighting it bravely. I can name women who are uh, fighting for their grandchildren in the battle. They're fighting bravely. I can think of women that are in um, a, a horrible marriage and they're fighting bravely. They pray to God. I can think of women who um, are poor, really, really poor. And they're struggling to keep their kids on the straight and narrow, to keep them um, not making bad decisions, but they have to work and it's all, it's just all crazy. Their life is crazy, but they're fighting bravely. So it is, it's, it's, this poem is about valor. It's about courage. It's about bravery. It's not about a checkoff list. Oh, let's see. I, um... Uh, let's see. Well, I can't do that one. I didn't do that one. Um, let me see. I'm not afraid of snow for her household in Michigan. I'm not afraid of snow. Okay. Well, anyway, so, um, you know, in our church, we, we do, we celebrate women of valor all the time. Our heart breaks when our women's hearts break. This is a day to celebrate all women 
whatever they're going through. It's a celebration of their heartache. You know, as women, we do suffer a lot of heartache. Not because we're women, just because heartache comes our way. But when we are brave and we stand, it's amazing. God is so pleased with us. That's what this that's what this um, passage is about. Um, you know, there's so many women in the Bible you can look at. Think of Ruth, for instance. She wouldn't sound like this woman in Proverbs at all. She was poor. Her husband had died. She didn't have children. Um, she didn't make clothes. She didn't even have a husband to make clothes for. Think about it. But she went into the fields and worked all day in the sun. That was her job as a poor person. And then she would go wherever the provisions were for poor people to get the leftovers from others. Does that sound like Proverbs 31? But she was brave. She was so brave that Boaz said, um, he said in Ruth 3.11, All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. See, it doesn't matter where you live, what you own, what you, you know, what cars you drive. It's your character. It's your character. Women of valor in the face of danger have great courage. You know, I've witnessed people, and I won't name their names, but have lost a daughter, have lost a grandson, have lost, and they are courageous. And you would never know it. You would never know their loss. They have moments. I've known others that have have lost a lot. And they just keep going. And they're an inspiration to everyone. That is a woman of valor. Who can find her? Who can find her? So even when I think about women that are divorced and they live with that shame, that heartache, Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. You are making it. You are making, and you're following the Lord and you're making a difference. And that marriage wasn't just one person. It was two. And it it didn't work. So keep going. Don't give up. You know, there's other women in the Bible we can think about. Sarah, Deborah, Mary of Magdalene. Mary of Nazareth, Jesus' mother, Mary and Martha, and then there's other ones too. They were women of valor. They were courageous. They were courageous. That's what we want to celebrate this day. Not if you're a mother or not a mother or married or not married. Celebrate valor today. Um... So, again, let's go back to Proverbs 31, 30. And we'll end with this. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. That's what we want today. We want to celebrate women who fear the Lord today. That's the kind of Mother's Day we want. That's Forget calling it Mother's Day. Call it Women Who Fear the Lord Day. And, you know, um, I think it's interesting, you know, now that I'm older, the phrase before it, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, I can tell you that's true. I mean, when you get old, you look in the mirror sometimes and you go, who is that person? (laughs) And so, you know, we, we can't hold on to those kind of things. We, as we get older especially, we need to hold on so tightly to the Lord because that's what matters. That's, that's who matters. And you will only be victorious in Christ. So today, take the focus uh, off what the world claims this day to be. And focus it on being a woman of valor. All of you watching are a, wom- are a woman of valor. You fear God. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And, and if you don't believe me, go and research some of these women in the Bible. 
think of Mary. And my friends laughed because I felt sorry for Mary. Because Mary, the mother of Jesus, suffered incredibly. Incredibly. How would any mother like to stand at that awful cross and watch her son die? And then he disappears. And now you're heartbroken again. Somebody stole his body. It's, it's just so heartbreaking. Yeah, I did feel sorry for Mary. Many times I felt sorry for her. Is the heartache she felt. But you know what? She braved the storms. She believed in her son, Jesus Christ. So today, we partake of communion. Let us remember all those women in the Bible that were courageous in, in times of battle. And what does battle mean to any of us? It looks different for each one of us. Some of you might battle poverty. Some of you are battling aloneness. Some of you are battling an illness. It all looks different for us. But let us be strong warriors full of courage and bravery and overcome the things of this world. So make sure you have your bread. And we're going to thank Jesus now. Um, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for um, your incredible, your incredible life. We thank you for your incredible death. And we thank you for your incredible resurrection. Lord, I pray in this hour that all the women watching, Lord, become stronger in you. Become full of valor, full of courage, full of bravery. That whatever they're facing today, they do it knowing that They fear the Lord and their lives will be forever changed because of that. We will not be stuck in holes or stuck in ditches. We will not be alone. We will be surrounded by other women who are fighting the battle. So Lord, thank you for showing us how. Thank you for leading the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, again, we're reminded of your, your, your sacrifice and what it cost you, the beatings, the incredibly awful beatings that left you disfigured, didn't even know who you were after them, and all the blood that was shed, dear God, for us sinners. Lord, thank you again for being a man of valor, for being a God of valor, for being one who fought the battle and won. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being our example in all that you did. And help us this day and every day to fear you and to walk bravely in our battles. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day. My day is going to be doing whatever I want, and that could mean taking a nap. Probably will be. And I want to announce Sunday school. You know, we do have... Um, people that are so dedicated, I, I'm, I'm not in that position, but there are others that are so dedicated to teaching the youth. And um, thank you again, everybody, um, for tuning in. We really appreciate this, and um, we're proud of our church. We're proud of all the members, and we're proud of what we stand for. And I hope that, you know, when people hear us or watch us or come and visit us, eventually that they'll see that we are a church of integrity we're really we we're just a little tiny church uh, in a little tiny area but loving our community and um, I hope they love us back so amen have a good day bye-bye good morning we are continuing in our Colossians 1 Isaiah 53 collaboration to understand how apostolic and prophetic impartation work. We might as well go back to Colossians 1 again just to start. And then we'll be looking at Isaiah again as well as some passages from the Gospels. While we're heading to Colossians, I just want to announce next Sunday, the 16th, 
uh, Apostle Reggie Holiday will be sharing. Um, it, it'll be sharing a, a, a Zoom service. He'll it'll still be online when you come to hear Lord of the Harvest next week. You'll start off with worship again, and then at eleven o'clock we will take you to Greensboro, North Carolina, and Apostle Holiday will be sharing a powerful word building the Father's house. I've heard him just speak on this briefly at a leadership meeting um, a few weeks back. It was so powerful. And the word, it, it, it really flows with what we're teaching. I mean, we are teaching on building the Father's house. We're teaching on impartation of leadership to bring the church into maturity. And this is building the Father's house. And his word is going to just really, it's just going to let the light shine. We will get an impartation from him as well. And we will be blessed. So next next week, really, get on uh, at 11 o'clock. If it's like, oh, I, I love hearing Pastor Jan, but there goes Pastor Oz on and on and on and on. Well, it won't be Pastor Oz next week. It'll be Reggie Holiday, and you'll be greatly blessed. Colossians 1, Paul says in verse 24, this has been our central verse. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the sake of his body, which is the church. And we know that Paul mentions in the previous verse, verse 23, he talks about the gospel which he proclaimed, uh, which has been proclaimed in all the creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a servant. He makes reference to his ministry as the servant of the Lord in verse 23, mentions suffering, his suffering, but a suffering that brings impartation to the church in verse 24. And then verse 25, he again mentions his role as the servant, of which I became a servant according to the commissioning uh, which God has given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul sandwiches his ministry of impartational suffering with this idea of the fact that he sees himself as the servant of the Lord. Now, we, we spoke in Colossians 1, there's a fourfold pattern of impartation. Thanksgiving, that is the, the apostle, the leader, himself or herself, his life is right with the Lord. And thanksgiving is what characterizes the life of, a, of righteousness, the life of truth, the life of grace. He speaks a proclamation, that's the gospel being taught and proclaimed and prophesied and declared, modeled. He speaks of intercessory prayer, and then he speaks of suffering. Now, when Paul saw himself as the servant, we've got to go back to, of course, um, the servant songs and the servant texts in Isaiah 40 through 55, we want to try to cover as many of those passages as we're able today. There is uh, the servant is portrayed in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and Isaiah 53. I want you to go back to Isaiah 53 right now, but on your way back to Isaiah 53, uh, what we want to remember is that when the Jews read Isaiah 53, they thought of Moses. When the Jews asked, whom is the Lord referring to here as his servant, there are so many allusions, so many references, so many images in the life of the servant, and actually all th scattered throughout Isaiah 40 through 55, which is a single prophecy, to Moses. There's so many references that you might say the Jews, when they read this, they thought of Moses. Now, when Jesus read this, Jesus thought of Moses and Isaiah, because Isaiah is the one who's prophesying, and he's thinking of not only Moses' life, but the whole historical reality 
under Isaiah, the significance of Isaiah's prophecy for Israel returning from the exile. So Jesus, when he looks at Isaiah 53, he sees Moses and Isaiah. When Paul now looks at Isaiah 53, then he would see Moses, he would see Isaiah, and he would see Jesus. All of these biblical images contributed to Paul working out his ministry as an apostle apostolically, working it out Christologically, working it out in terms of being a servant of the Lord. And so we want to we want to look at that. And what we want to look at in particular, let's let's go to Isaiah 53. And we've spent the, the past few weeks both in Bible study and in our Sunday sermon. I got to do a Bible study before the sermon one Sunday in place of worship. And praise God for the worship today. It was awesome, just as last week was. Hallelujah. So we've been talking a lot about the implications of Isaiah 53 for Jesus, who is the servant of the Lord. And remember, all of Isaiah 53, which is the fourth and the final servant song or servant text or passage that relates the biography, the ideal life of the servant of the Lord, it all ends or it culminates, it concludes with Isaiah 53, 12, and that's what I want to read. Therefore, I, that's the Lord, I will divide him, that's the servant, that's Jesus, I will divide him as his portion, the many. The many become the portion of the servant of the Lord. All the nations, Israel, all those who will put their faith in him, they all become his inheritance. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. There's this sense of the Lord, what he receives, he imparts to us. We're, we're part of his retinue of the saints of the Most High. We're his disciples, we're his people, we're his family, we're his sons, we're his daughters, we're his servants. Because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the criminals. We're the criminals. That's, that's God's perspective of us. That's God's perspective of Israel. That's God's perspective of the nation. We're all criminals. It wasn't just a select few criminals who were crucified around Jesus who were criminals. They represented the Son of God's death, the Son of God's crucifixion, the Son of God's uh, burying the image of the cross into the consciousness, into the skull of humanity. They actually represented all humanity. It's the suffering servant suffering in the midst of criminals, pouring out his life for criminals so that criminals might be transformed into sons and daughters. That was the servant's ministry. That is anyone who considers himself the servant of the Lord as Paul, an apostolic leader, a leader in the body of Christ. That is the, the role of leadership. Leadership is to be a servant. Leadership is not to be a CEO. Leadership is not to be an emperor. Leadership is not to be served, but to rather to serve, and you serve by laying down your life as a ransom for the many. And the many comes, of course, from here, Isaiah 53, and the uh, last few verses of Isaiah 52. He poured out his soul, his life, unto death. He was numbered with the criminals. He carried the sins of the many. And in doing all of this, the final statement of the suffering servant that summarizes his life is that he makes inter session for the transgressors. To make intercession is this great exchange that happens where the righteousness and the life and the faithfulness of Christ is poured out into us through him. And that's called intercession. That's an intercessory minister. Jesus is an intercessor and it is in 
his intercessory ministry that he continues to impart his life to his church and his body to mature them. What we want to see is the same thing holds true for leaders in the body of Christ. We are to pour out our lives in suffering, in intercession, in thankfulness, and in proclamation of the gospel that we may bring an impartation that leads the body of Christ to maturity. Paul would continue in Colossians 1, as we've read the past few weeks, that he works and he labors and he agonizes for one thing, to present every man mature in Christ. So what we want to do is, looking at this from an impartational and uh, intercessorial perspective, what does it mean then for us as leaders in the body of Christ to make intercession? Well, we're going to look at the first servant song, the first servant text, the first entrance of the servant in this Isaiah 40 through 55 prophecy. That's one long prophecy. It's like a, the book of Revelation. It's one long prophecy. We're going to go to Isaiah 42. This is where the servant first appears. And in looking at 42, 49, 50, and 53, we'll see four aspects of the servant's ministry. We'll, we'll come to understand the source of his authority. We'll, we'll, we'll recognize what that ministry is. We'll recognize how the, how the servant of the Lord goes forth and, and makes intercession and brings impartation. And we'll see it, we want to see it on that dual level. This is what Jesus did for us salvifically. This is what we do for each other as fivefold leaders, as leaders, as, as elders, as bishops, as overseers, as ministry leaders. This is what we do eschatologically. Remember, there's, Paul is not talking about any salvific dimension. He, his impartation doesn't bring anybody salvation. Jesus and Jesus alone, that's, that's his realm. That's where we say that's above our pay grade. But eschatologically, that is bringing the church into maturity, establishing God's purpose in human history, we need to image and model what Jesus did, what Moses did, what Isaiah did. Now keep in mind that this entire prophecy, Isaiah 40 through 55, is a courtroom scene. It's much like Daniel 7. It all takes place in this heavenly courtroom. And Yahweh is there, the, the, the God of, of all the earth. And all these other figures are gathered there. Israel's in this courtroom. The nations of the earth are in this courtroom. The leaders of the nations of the earth, the leaders of the Babylonian Empire who are being judged, and the leader uh, Cyrus, the leader of the Persian Empire, the leader of the Persian Empire who is going, God is going to raise up to break the power of Babylon to help Israel return from exile. The coastlands are there. Greece is in the background. The, the next major empire that's going to rise up in the earth is going to be Greek. They're all there. The heavenly council is there. The, all the supernatural beings, angelic beings, cherubim, seraphim, elders, these, these supernatural powers and principalities are gathered there. The, the prophets are gathered there. And the servant of the Lord is gathered there as well. All these figures are gathered in the courtroom of the Lord. And in 42, the courtroom stops and the Lord says, Behold my servant. See my servant. Chapters 40 and 41, uh, the purposes of the Lord uh, are, are being laid out for Israel. There are a lot of different voices speaking and worship is going on and the Lord is speaking and there's responses to the Lord and all these different voices are kind of setting in motion the purpose of these courtroom proceedings. And then all of a sudden we see in Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant. Everybody stop. The voice, the heavenly voice, speaks forth, and the servant of the Lord comes forth. Behold my servant, 
whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul takes pleasure, in whom my soul delights. This is God the Father speaking to God the Son, my beloved Son. Behold my servant, I uphold him. I hold him in my hand. I, my authority is behind him. And, and so, so we're seeing right from the start, the servant is upheld by the Lord's authority. The servant is the one who is chosen, the elect one by the Lord. And the Lord's delight is in this servant. The, the pleasure, the love, the delight, the, the, the desire, the passion of the Lord is focused upon this servant. And then the Lord says, I have put my spirit upon him. This is, this is very much the picture of, of, of Jesus' water baptism in Matthew chapter 3. It's, it's a very clear allusion to it. When we get done with um, the, the first few verses of chapter 42, which lay out the servant, we want, we're going to go back to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and show some parallels where Matthew uh, points out that Jesus is the servant who's being discussed here in Isaiah 42. And there are other allusions early on in Jesus' ministry, but one of the clearest is the baptism of Jesus. Because that's when the Spirit of the Lord, the Father said, this is the Son of my love in whom my soul takes pleasure, and then the Spirit of God comes down upon him. This, too, is a Trinitarian picture, just as the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 3 is. You have Father, you have Son, and Spirit. I have put my Spirit on him. And this is, we begin to see now, purpose number one that is being fulfilled by the servant of the Lord. There will be an emphasis on justice. He will bring forth justice. And here's a shock. He'll bring forth justice to Israel. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. There's something global about what the servant of the Lord is going to do. There's something global about what the early church saw was apostolic ministry. And it's true today. The Lord is not just going to have a single people, but he's going to use how he deals with that single people, Israel, to really release a mission for all the nations in the earth. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, we start to see aspects of the ministry here. The first thing is he brings forth justice to the nations. The second is he will not cry out aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. It's very interesting. He's not going to make a, a, an, an emotional appeal. It's not about crying out loudly. It's not about shouting. It's not about screaming. It's not about being a street person who, is, who publicizes everything he does. Nowadays, we create heroes by publicity. This is not going to be a, a worldly hero. The servant figure is going to speak very quietly, very calmly, very, very confidently. Though he may minister to the crowds, Jesus did. His goal isn't to minister to the crowds. As we see constantly in Jesus' ministry, there's this shift between the crowds and the few. And oftentimes, the greatest fruit takes place among the few and not among the crowds. Crowds are fickle. Crowds come and crowds go. Crowds flow with popularity. What's, what's popular right now? This is not part of the demeanor of the servant. He will not cry out aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. He's not going to have an agent to publicize what he does. The life, the testimony of the servant himself will be sufficient. Third thing, a bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not extinguish, he will not quench. Now those images are pictures of vulnerability, 
a, a broken reed, a very vulnerable plant, uh, a candle on its way out. It speaks of vulnerability. In fact, I want to read this from the Targum of Isaiah. The Targum is the Aramaic translation. We, we have our Hebrew translation. That's considered our canonical scripture. There is a Greek translation known as the Septuagint, and there are a few variations of that. And then there is what's known as the Aramaic Targum. That's an Aramaic paraphrase of the Old Testament. I want you to see what the, the Targum here says about this particular verse. Uh, let's actually, let's, let's read the first four verses. Behold my servant, I will bring him near. My chosen one in whom my living word is pleased to dwell. I will put my Holy Spirit upon him and he will reveal my justice to the peoples. He will not cry or call or lift up his voice outside. And then when we get here to the... Uh, bruised reed, the broken reed, the faintly burning wick. This is how the Targum translates it. The poor who are like a bruised reed, he will not break. And the needy who are like a dimly burning wick, he will not quench. He will bring forth his justice. He will bring forth justice for his truth. the images of the reed and the wick, broken reed, wick about to go out, were pictures of the vulnerable. And see, this is going to be the, the ministry. When we read Isaiah 61 later on in 3rd Isaiah, chapters 56 through 66, you see in Isaiah 61, the, the Messiah comes forth. And of course, Jesus used Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 as his uh, ministry statement in Luke chapter 4. He's identifying himself there not with the servant of the Lord, but with the Messiah. The Lord will send forth, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon the anointed one who will be the Messiah. And that ministry statement deals simply with the broken, the wounded, the vulnerable, whether they're, they're, they're broken physically they're broken economically. Justice has been taken from them and they're broken because of that. They're broken inwardly. They have broken hearts. Uh, or they're, they're political prisoners. The Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon the Messiah. And so Jesus as the Messiah in Isaiah 61 agrees with Jesus as the servant in Isaiah 42. Justice has its focus on the vulnerable. So that's the third aspect of his ministry here. He's going to bring forth justice. He's not going to cry out and, 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 be, and promote himself in a dramatic, uh, outward kind of manner. He's going to minister to the vulnerable. And finally, and he will bring forth justice in truth. He will faithfully bring forth justice. So we have justice and we have emmet, we have truth, we have faithfulness. And all of this will be because the Spirit of the Lord is upon the servant. He will not grow faint nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. Third time justice is mentioned. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait for his law. Now remember, the coastlands refer to the Greek empire that is looming in the background. I mean, it's, it's Persia's hour right now. Babylon has been put down. Persia is being raised up. But Greece will eventually put down Persia and be raised up. And those, the coastlands represent the Greek world. The Greek world is waiting in the background. And so having Babylon, Persia, and Greece all in this prophecy of Isaiah is reminding us what are the extent of the fact 
that he will bring forth justice to the nations. It's all the nations of the earth. It's not just Israel. It's God's work in Israel through the servant that will create a mission for all the nations of the earth. The coastlands will wait for his law, will wait for his instruction. Now, you know, Cyrus comes in and conquers Babylon. Cyrus, the great Persian king, conquers Babylon. It's the way of the world. Political means is the way of the world. The world comes in and through its politics, through its economics, uh, through its military practices, that's the way the world establishes authority. But you see, it's not going to be the world that's going to establish the authority of God's kingdom. It's going to be the servant that's going to establish God's kingdom. And see, all of this furor about who's president and what nation is the chosen nation and what nation is going to be the dominant one in the earth, although those are all important issues with important significance. We live in a political world. There are political consequences. The word of the Lord in Daniel 7, the word of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55 says, but that's not what will ultimately establish God's kingdom purposes in human history. It's going to come through the teaching, through the instruction of the servant through the instruction of justice, through the instruction of truth, through the instruction of humility, through the instruction of ministering to the vulnerable. And it will come when the Spirit of the Lord comes on the servant to establish these things. So while Babylon it goes down and Persia rises up and Greece is in the background, they're going to rise up. The point is, is None of those have final say. None of those are of ultimate significance in human history. Maybe pent-ultimate, which means the one thing before the ultimate. I mean, political realities and nations of the earth are, 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 are important to human history, but they do not have ultimate authority. The Greeks, they're waiting for his law. Now, this is proclamation. You, you, you can see some of the things here going on in even what Paul is saying in Colossians 1. There's proclamation. And that's what is, 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 is being stated here. In the background, even though Isaiah 53, the final servant song, is where we really see suffering coming to the forefront, in the other servant passages, suffering emerges. Suffering is emerging. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. In Jesus' ministry to establish the justice of God's kingdom, the fact that God wants to open up his blessing to all the nations, all the peoples of the earth, the fact that God is driven by, not by punishment, driven by justice. Mercy triumphs over judgment, James says. The fact that the Lord is motivated by that, there will still be suffering to, to bring that forth to a, a world that, that has all kinds of other different solutions on how to get things done. So there will be discouragement. There will be a sense of fainting, growing faint, being discouraged, struggling, feeling weak, feeling like a failure. Those, those things are there. The, the image of suffering is, is beginning. But remember, the coastland's waiting for his law. Keep your hand in Isaiah 52 and just go back briefly to Isaiah chapter 2. Remember, Isaiah 1 through 39, first Isaiah, that establishes the historical life and historical prophecies and historical experiences of Isaiah. Second Isaiah is 40 through 55, this long prophecy that deals with the establishment of God's kingdom as Israel goes into exile and Israel returns from exile. And then third Isaiah is Isaiah 56 through 66, where once again, this emerging figure of the Messiah shows us how 
God's people will sustain revival. You know, it's one thing to enter into revival. It's another thing to sustain revival. All the, all the passages in the scripture that talk about God's people being prepared, and in order to be prepared, you have to do this or do that, those are eschatological passages. So those are not salvific passages. What you do, if you even call it that, for salvation is believe in him whom the Father has sent. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the servant. Believe in the Messiah. Allow God's grace to transform your heart. To believe. That's salvific. But all the passages in Scripture that appear to say, well, we need to do this and we need to do that to qualify. We need to walk worthy of the Lord. Those are eschatological purposes. And that's how we sustain the new work of salvation that God has given us. God gives us salvation that we might be transformed and bring salvation to others. To sustain what God has set in motion, of course we need to have the transforming work and power of the Holy Spirit in us. The purpose now, when you look at those three sections of Isaiah, when you begin to read Isaiah 40 through 55, that prophecy, there will be all kind of references to things that were spoken in Isaiah 1 through 39. They're spoken in Isaiah 1 through 39. They're fulfilled in the second prophecy by the servant of the Lord, by the work of Yahweh in Isaiah 40 through 55. And then they're sustained in Isaiah 56 through 66. So that's the picture of the three books of Isaiah. The Lord telling us what he's going to do, the Lord doing it, and then the Lord showing us how to sustain what he's done. And here's what he's doing. Isaiah 2 verse 1, the word of the Lord that the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. That's Zion being established. We're, we see at the, in the latter parts of Isaiah 40 through 55 and then in Isaiah 56 through 66 what it means that Zion will be established in the earth. Zion is the dwelling place of the Lord. Zion is the house of the Lord. Zion is the city of the Lord. Zion and Jerusalem are the people of the Lord. But notice the purpose is all nations shall flow to it. This is, this is the servant who is going to bring forth justice to the nations, and that justice is going to cause all the nations to flow to Zion. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And what's he going to do? He'll teach us his ways. We may walk in his paths. His ways reveal who God is. Walking in his path is the Lord teaching us how to be co-laborers with him in the establishment of his kingdom purposes in the earth. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, the law, instruction, teaching, and the word of the Lord. There's prophetic utterance from Jerusalem. The ways of the Lord, the path of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, the prophetic word of the Lord, Zion being established and many nations going up there. Now when it says, for out of Zion shall go forth his law, that brings us back to Isaiah 42, verse 4, and the Greek world is waiting for his law. We complete the first servant song with a prophecy. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes forth from it, now notice this picture. Now, this is, this is a creation picture. The former things are Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the Lord creating the universe. The new things are he's going to recreate the new heavens and the new earth by bringing Israel back from exile. And then, of course, all that foreshadows the new creation that's going to take place in Christ. But notice, who is God the Lord? El Yahweh. 
the, all, the God over all the nations, the God over all the earth, the God over all the gods, whose name is Yahweh. That's his personal name, his family name. Thus says God the Lord. So the servant is announced, and now Yahweh is prophesying over the servants. This is an installation service. He is being installed. Um, the 42, 1 through 4 is a vocational statement. It's a, it's a, um, a, a word of vocation that describes his ministry. Verses 5 through 9 is he is being installed. He's being commissioned apostolically, just as Paul said, I've re received this commission from the Lord. And he calls himself in verse 25 of Colossians 1, the servant of the Lord. So this is what Yahweh prophesies. And you know, when, when somebody's installed into a ministry, prophecies are uttered over that person's installation. And here's what the installation prophetic utterance is over the servant. And the one who's speaking it is the one who created the heavens and stretched them out. He's the creator of Genesis 1 and 2. And, and the images here, he stretches it out like a tent. So the mission of the Lord in which the servant is being commissioned to partake is being stretched out like a tent. It's not just going to be Israel. It's going to have this expanse that's going to bring all the nations, all the people groups into it. That's why one new man in Christ, aka the, um, the 21st century, should be white, black, brown, yellow, red, all together in churches, all together in unity in Christ, all together in unity in terms of God's word and not political parties. We sh this, is, this is the tent, the tent that's being expanded for all the nations to come in. There will be no favored, elite, entitled group, no more male and female in which at, at that time in history, when Paul quoted it, no more male privilege, no more Jew or Gentile, Jews were privileged, no, 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 more, no more ethnic privilege, no more gender privilege, no more slave or free, no more economic privilege. spread out. All are one in Christ Jesus. The one who creates the heavens, he spreads them out. The one who founds the earth, the one who spread out the earth, ESV, but the, the Hebrew is places a firm foundation for the earth. See, the heavens are spread out like a tent. The earth are going to have a firm foundation. So it's going to be wide and it's going to be solid. It's going to be established. It's going to have continuity. It's going to have sustainability. It is going to last. Jesus said in John 15, you'll bear fruit and the fruit will remain. The fruit will last. Heavens and the earth, okay? That's a, that's a reminder again of Genesis 1 and 2. And the third imagery he stretches out the heavens, makes a firm foundation of the earth, and sees what springs forth from the seed of the earth. And what comes out of the earth. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth between the Hebrew and, uh, and ESV. So it's three things. The heavens are stretched out, out, the earth is made firm, and there is great fruitfulness that comes out of the earth. What springs forth from it? And that's, that's all Genesis 1 language about the heavens, the earth, and how the Lord made the earth to be fruitful. This is about seed producing fruit. And so the image here of seed producing fruit, remember seed can be something sown in the ground that creates uh, a tree or a plant that gives us something edible, but seed can also be descendants. So the, the, this, this imagery, this biblical imagery of what the servant is going to accomplish is wide ranging, but it doesn't stop there. Then it goes on and says, he's the one who gives breath to the people on it 
and he gives his spirit to those who walk in it. He gives breath to the people on it. That's 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 an exact reference. Same Hebrew word is used in the creation when the Lord picked up the man, he formed him from the ground, and he breathed into him the breath of life. And then just as the spirit, he breathes life, the, the, this, 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 um, this servant will be able to breathe life. And there was a reference to that same thing when Jesus was raised from the dead and he, he, he met the disciples in the upper room in Gospel of John chapter 20. It said, and he said, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just as Yahweh breathed into the face of Adam and he came alive, Jesus breathes in the face of his disciples and they become alive again in terms of being ministers of the new covenant. And, and we as leaders, that's an image of impartation. We are to be able to breathe on others and give them life through the proclamation of the gospel, through intercessory prayer, for people through prophetic encouragement. We are seeing that our breath creates impartation. And then just as the Spirit is put on the servant in 42.1, the Spirit will empower those to walk in this new heaven and new earth that the Lord is going to ultimately recreate through his servant. And then he says, I am the Lord. And he's now he's, he's commissioning the servant. I'm the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. So there's a call, a declaration over the servant that imparts righteousness to the servant in his installation. I will take you by the hand. I will be the one leading you in ministry. I will keep you. I will guard what I have entrusted to you. The deposit I've placed in you as the servant, I will guard it. I will keep it. He continues, I will give you as a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. I will give you as a covenant. You will be my representative of my covenant relationship. Covenant speaks of, of God making promises that he will fulfill through relationship. And it's for the nation. See, this is what's amazing. It's not just for Israel. Israel's part of it, but it's for the nations. And, and, and as I accomplish these things, this is, remember, a prophetic installation. And here's what you're going to accomplish. When I give you as a covenant for the people. When I make you a light for the nations, you will open the eyes that are blind. You will bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And keep in mind the language here, the, the, the prison that is being spoken of here in the Hebrew is debtor's prison. It's bond slavery. It's, it's, Literally, it is ransoming them from the imprisonment of debt. This is very important. This is, this is language that, that, that is the description uh, that we see in uh, Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy of God's people being ransomed from the oppression of debt, from debt slavery. It's the language in Nehemiah where Nehemiah commanded the people returning from the exile to set those people that were enslaved to them, their own people who were enslaved to them because of debt, to set them free. It's the language of Jeremiah. Jeremiah almost, in, in, in his prophecy, almost got the Babylonian exile stopped. He got the people to agree to let their slaves free. Fellow Israelites, slavery is different in, in the Old Testament. Uh, in Israel, it's, it's normally debt slavery. And the, the debt slavery has to do with the fact that if you had a debt to somebody, you just sold yourself into their service until that debt was paid off. Couldn't take longer than uh, seven years, but you, you had that. 
And it's, it's very interesting in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah appeals to the leaders and the wealthy people in Jerusalem before Babylon comes in to destroy and he gets them to agree to release all those who were in debt and in slavery because of debt. He all, it, it was as if that in itself could revert, that, that in itself could, could cause, excuse me, could cause a reversal of God's judgment to send exile. Because that's the whole point of the Sabbath year. That's the whole point of the year of Jubilee. People have their inheritance restored to them. Debt is canceled. People are set free from slavery. That's the whole point. And it was because Israel had not fulfilled those things that they were going into exile. Okay? America, the Christian nation. How do we save America? No, it's not the political party we, we, we vote for or the presidential candidate we get in. If we were to deal with the issue of debt and poverty and oppression, if we were to deal with justice as the suffering servant, as the servant of the Lord is raised up for, well, then we can save America. We can save any nation. What, whether it'll happen or not, I don't know. But that's the picture here. And so in this commissioning... It's a commissioning to say you're going to fulfill the year of Jubilee. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from prison those who sit in darkness to open the eyes of the blind. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. By the servant being established, by his ministry being established, he puts down idolatry. He establishes justice. He releases the captives. He brings forth God's justice. He topples idolatry in doing this. And the prophecy is concluded because, you know, it's verse 6 says, I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. Verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. It's a revelation of who the Lord is in the servant through the servant's work of justice that brings forth the impartation necessary for the Lord's kingdom purposes to be established in the earth. Behold, the former things have come to pass. I, 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 I created the earth in Genesis 1 and 2. I ransomed Israel from Egypt in the book of Exodus, those former things have come to pass, but I am now going to declare new things. And before they come to pass, I'm going to speak them to you. And then it goes right into sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. So the new thing that the Lord is going to do, first, justice is going to be established through the work of the servant. Now, I said I want to go to the New Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. Go to, go to the Gospel of Matthew. We want to see images of the servant, first, the servant's first appearance in Isaiah 42. We want to see them in a few places in the Gospel of Matthew. Go with me to Matthew 3, first of all. We will go back to Isaiah, but we want to go to Matthew 3. Matthew 3, we already alluded to this, but I want to read it. The baptism of Jesus is a picture of Isaiah 42 and what Yahweh speaks to his son, his servant. Matthew 3, Jesus, Matthew 3.13, Jesus came from Galilee to John to the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Remember what Isaiah 42, 6 says, I am the Lord, I've called you in righteousness. Jesus has Isaiah 42 in his mind, in his heart, as he 
steps forth in the baptism. He understands. See, this is the thing about true apostolic and prophetic leadership. Jesus understood everything in his life in terms of the narrative of the, of the entire Old Testament. He was always saying, oh, okay, this is Isaiah 42. Oh, okay, this is Genesis 12. Oh, okay, this is Isaiah 53. Oh, okay, this is Psalm 22. Oh, this is Daniel 7. Jesus interpreted his entire life through the direction of the narrative of the Old Testament. He placed himself in the Old Testament and saw the Old Testament being fulfilled in his life. This is how we are to be as leaders in the body of Christ. What am I going through this, Lord? Well, what scripture are you pressing into or is God trying to press into you at this particular moment of your life? And when we, you begin to think that way, you're, you're thinking then the way the servant of the Lord thinks. See, that's how, that's how Paul dealt with everything that came his way. Oh, I got stoned and left for dead. Well, that's all right. This is a fulfillment of the scripture. Oh, I'm in prison now and yeah, I might die. Well, that's okay. That's a fulfillment of the scripture. Oh, these wonderful things are taking place in my life. Well, I understand the significance of why these wonderful things are taking place in my life because that's this scripture. And by the way, remember, all the scriptures that Paul was thinking about was Old Testament. We have the New Testament scriptures to think into those. But Jesus and Paul and all the disciples who wrote the New Testament thought in terms of the Old Testament. So this, this um, separation and saying, well, we don't read the Old Testament because we're New Testament Christians. Or That's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. That's, fl that's flawed thinking. It's flawed thinking. Now that Christ has come, we can see all Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, Christologically. If you, the, the believer who sees the Old Testament Christologically is superior to a New Testament believer who, who can read the New Testament and tell you the correct doctrines of the New Testament but doesn't see the New Testament Christologically. But our ideal is we see the Old and the New Christologically. We see Christ at the center. So Jesus says, no, 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 John baptized me. This is Isaiah 42. It's got to come to pass. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, my beloved one, in whom I... I am well pleased. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. Now, Matthew goes one step further. Go to Matthew 12. And, and I want you to see, Jesus is in the midst of, of, uh, of healing. At the start of Jesus' ministry, he does a lot of healing. He does teaching. He does healing. Uh, as his ministry progresses, he still does teaching and healing, but he begins to speak more prophetically, more directly to what's going on. At the start of his ministry, he's just interested in people hearing the instruction of the Lord and seeing the miracles. But as Jesus gets closer, he gets more precise about who he is and what he's called to do. He doesn't announce to his disciples right away that he's going to die. And he doesn't like people when they begin to declare that he's the Messiah. He doesn't like people at the start of his ministry going forth and telling everybody that. That's precisely what takes place here in Matthew 12. So Jesus is healing. He heals a, a man with a withered hand in Matthew 12, um, verses uh, 12 and 13. Uh, and then um, the, the, the Pharisees are angry with him. They want to plot his death. Isn't that amazing? The Messiah they've been waiting all their lives for come, and, and they want to put him to death. Stranger things, brethren, stranger things. But I want to pick up the context in verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, knew that they were going to try to destroy him, and here is a major reason why the Lord wants things hidden and not disclosed, and why he's not going to put on this big publicity show by crying out, screaming out in the streets, lifting up his voice, making it heard everywhere. 
But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Jesus went from the public areas to the private areas, and people followed him to those private areas, and he healed them all. So what we're talking about here is the healing ministry of Jesus. Yet he warned them not to make him known at this point, not to make him known, because, see, we have to catch up with where God is. God doesn't have to catch up where we're at. He, we have to catch up where he's at. That he's the Messiah is an absolute truth and a reality proved by his teaching, proved by his miracle, proved by his casting out of demons. But see, people see him and they say, Messiah, and they have all kind of crazy ideas, their own ideas in their head as to what makes the Messiah the Messiah. And Jesus has to not only reveal that he's the Messiah to us, and he says it when, when Peter says it in Matthew 16, Peter says, blessed are you, Lord. You know, you're, you're, you're the, Jesus says, who am I? You know, and well, some people say you're Jeremiah, you're one of the prophets, you're Elijah, you're, you're a great man, whatever. Who do you say I'm in? Peter says, Lord, you're the, you're the, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. I'm the Messiah and I'm going to die. And then Peter says, oh no, you can't die. And Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. So within the same vessel, we can have a, we understand who Jesus is, but we have all kind of false ideas in our, in our own hearts and minds about what that means. And see, the Lord has to reveal who he is to us. There's that salvific dimension. Then he has to take us through the eschatological dimension. He has to teach us his purposes and his ways. We can look at that. A more common way of looking at it is we're saved and we're justified, and then we go through the process of sanctification. Matthew 12 again, verse 15, he warned them not to make him known because they've got to really begin to understand, oh yes, you are the Messiah, and what does that mean? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and oh my gosh, how is Jesus' healing ministry described? Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. Now the language is going to be a little bit different. We, we read from the Masoretic text. The text that Matthew is going to quote here, it looks kind of like a combination of the Greek text, the, of the Greek translation of Isaiah the Septuagint, but there's some, some, some passages that, that don't agree with the, the Septuagint. It looks more like a, maybe either a free translation of the Hebrew and the Greek of Isaiah 42, or perhaps Matthew had a hold of a text a translation, that is, of the Old Testament um, that we don't have at this stage. I mean, we have several versions of the Greek. We have the Masoretic. We have the Aramaic Targums. Uh, we, have, we have translations of portions of the Scripture from Qumran. Uh, we, we have some ancient copies of the Old Testament, but we don't have one here that, that agrees with everything that Matthew said. But nonetheless, it's Matthew saying, Jesus healing ministry fulfills Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. This is the vocational statement. So what does that say for us as leaders? We're called to be healers, brethren. And let's see how we bring healing. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved one in whom my soul is well pleased. Pretty similar to Isaiah 42, 1 in the Hebrew, but it adds my beloved in whom my soul takes pleasure. Not only is the servant the chosen one, not only is the servant the one in whom Yahweh's soul delights, but the servant is my beloved one. This is my beloved son in whom my soul is well pleased. Another interesting thing. The Greek word, the Greek word for my servant here is not the normal word that would translate eved, which is the Hebrew word for servant, that would be doulos. Uh, it would translate the, the, the word doulos uh, as a, a, a servant or a, a diakonos as the servant. 
This is the word pais, my servant who is my child. It's a servant who's a member of my family. It's one, the child is a servant until he's raised up in the house. The, the child of a wealthy man, a rich man, a king, is equal to a servant. He's trained by servants, raised up by servants in the house to take upon himself the family burden, the family vision, receiving the family inheritance to carry out the family purposes. So the servant, as Matthew fulfills Jesus or ascribes to Jesus, is the family servant. He's a child of the house. Behold my servant whom I am chosen, my beloved one in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring he will announce justice to the nations. He'll bring it forth in Isaiah 42, just like the seed brings forth fruit in the land. He'll bring it forth. Here, he'll announce it. He'll proclaim it. He will bring forth my justice to the nations. He will not quarrel. There's an interesting uh, slant to he'll not crowd. He'll not be quarrelsome. Jesus would not have been quarreling on Facebook with his brothers and sisters in Christ over political issues and whatever else, doctrinal issues, the way the church does it today. The church is not acting in alignment with the mission of the servant. They're not following the image of the servant. They're not walking in the grace of the servant. He will not quarrel. He'll not Cry out loudly, scream out, nor will anyone in the streets hear his voice. It's interesting. He's going to be in the streets healing and proclaiming, but they won't hear his voice in the streets. You have to press into the Lord, into Zion, into his place to really, truly hear his voice. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. Pretty, pretty much the same thing as the Hebrew text. Till he sends forth justice unto victory. There's going to be a triumphal victory of justice that justice will bring. And in his name, the nations will place their faith and their trust. All right, let's go to Isaiah 49 and just take the the, the, the remaining few minutes to look at the other two servant songs. Isaiah 49. We've already, we've looked extensively at Isaiah 53. So the first, first picture of the servant is he's going to bring justice. And you see, what is justice equated with in Matthew? Jesus' healing ministry. See, justice is, is what brings complete healing, physical healing emotional healing, human healing, personal healing, deep inner healing. It brings us healing from oppression, healing from demonic assault and attacks. Healing and justice are equated. I want you to go to Isaiah 49, but you know what? On your way to Isaiah 49, go to Isaiah 1. You know, Isaiah 1 sets the whole book in motion. The entire book is set in motion in Isaiah chapter 1. Now, he's, we know in Isaiah 1 through 39, there's going to be a lot of judgment. I mean, Isaiah, first Isaiah speaks of the judgment that the Lord is bringing upon his people for their disobedience. As it was true in Jeremiah, as it was true in Ezekiel, as it was true in Hosea, Amos, all those prophets spoke of the judgment that was to come. Now, we know there's redemption in Isaiah 40 through 55. That's why Isaiah 40 through 55 is called the fifth gospel. I mean, it's just, it's so powerful. It's, it really speaks the gospel. The Lord speaks of the inevitable judgment in first Isaiah. Second Isaiah, he speaks of the redemption that comes through the gospel. And then third Isaiah, he speaks of sanctification. And so there's this real gospel picture that runs through Isaiah. But before Isaiah goes into all the judgment, he says something very interesting. And I want to read this because it really comes forth well 
in the New English translation, the NET. This is what Isaiah 1, 5 says. At the start of Isaiah, the Lord makes a statement about the rebellion of Israel. And church, I want you to hear this. 21st century Christians, I want you to hear this. Heavy brother and sister Christians, I want you to hear this. Conspiracy theory Christians, I want you to hear this. Grace and mercy people, I want you to hear this. We need to hear this. At the start of Isaiah, where the Lord is about to launch into judgment that precedes redemption, the Lord talks about why God's people are about to enter into judgment. And in essence, kind of gives us a foreshadowing of what is necessary for the gospel to triumph. And it, it, it aligns quite well with Isaiah tying in Jesus' ministry of healing in Matthew 12 with the first servant song in Isaiah 42. This is, this is what um, Isaiah 1 says. Let's, let's, um, let's, let's start, let's actually, let's, let's read, read the, 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 the whole um, prophecy, uh, the initial part of the prophecy, the context that starts in Isaiah 1, verse 2. Listen, O heavens, pay attention to the earth. That's what it said, uh, that's what it will be saying in Isaiah 49. We'll see that momentarily. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, O earth, for the Lord speaks. I raised children. I brought them up, but they've rebelled against me. This is about Israel's rebellion. That's where Isaiah begins. An ox recognizes its owner. A donkey recognizes where its owner puts its food but Israel does not recognize me. My dog will do anything for a treat. If I put a treat in front of him, he'll, he'll do what I tell him to do to get that treat. Well, God's people should do anything that God puts before them just because he's God. But my people do not understand. They're not even as smart as the beasts. The sinful nation is as good as dead they are people weighed down by evil deeds. They are offspring who do wrong, children who do wicked things. They have abandoned the Lord and rejected the Holy One of Israel. And see, the Holy One of Israel is introduced here. And the Holy One of Israel, that, that title is used of the Lord numerous times through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah. Those of us who've been reading 2nd and 3rd Isaiah in our daily readings, you see Holy One of Israel, Holy One of Israel, Holy One of Israel. And actually 40 through through 66 define just who the Holy One of Israel is and what he looks like. They have rejected the Holy One of Israel. They are alienated from him. So this is talking about the basis of Israel's rebellion. I raised children. I brought them up, but they rebelled against me. They are alienated from him. Verse 5 says this, Why do you insist on being battered. Why do you continue to rebel? There's rebellion. But watch the circumstances that led to rebellion. Woundedness. Abuse. Violence. Oppression. Harm. Damage done to human souls. Why do you insist on being battered? Why do you continue to rebel? Your rebellion, the source of your rebellion, is that you're battered. Your head has a massive wound. Your whole body is weak. The source of your rebellion is you're battered. You have a massive wound. Your body is weakened, broken, failure, illness, abuse. From the soles of your feet to your head, there is no spot that is unarmed. There are only bruises, cuts, and open wounds. They have not been cleansed or bandaged. They have not been treated with olive oil. The source of Israel's rebellion was their lack of being healed. Their unhealedness. What are we supposed to do as leaders in the body of Christ? 
are we to batter people more? Are we to justify oppressing people, whether it's on a political level or some kind of distorted concept of Christian righteousness? Are we called to do that? When what the Lord says at the start of the entire book of Isaiah, judgment's coming because you've rebelled and you've rebelled because you're hurt, because you're wounded. So if there's going to be a restoration in 40 through 55, what should be the basis? Healing, brethren. It's cleansing people. It's bandaging people. It's treating people with olive oil. This is the implicit call of Isaiah. What does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to lead the nations up to God's holy hill in Isaiah 2? What does it mean to see the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the temple? My, my wife mentioned that last week. His train fills the temple. The train was the hem of his garment. And it was the wounded woman that Pastor Jan spoke about last week, the broken, unhealed woman. She reached out and touched the hem of his garment. The train of his temple, the hem of his garment, fills the temple and the whole earth cries glory. What is the glory of the Lord? It's to reach out and touch the hem of his garment and be healed. And as leaders, we're called to be healers. Right now, what the Lord has, the Lord's done one thing to me in this last year. He's closed me down. He's shut me down. That's why I don't care that Lord of the Harvest is shut down. I don't care how long it's shut down. He's shut me down, literally, and he's shut down down all these voices, the fear, the anger, the unhealedness inside of me and said, son, I'm going to heal you in this year of Jubilee. You're going to get your inheritance when you come out of this year of Jubilee. And this inheritance is that I'm going to heal you so you can go out and heal others. And you can start to see that what I called you for, what I called Paul for, what real apostolic and prophetic ministry is about, what I called the servant for, what I anointed my Messiah for, is to bring healing. And that healing has to start with the church needs to be healed. Who is blind like my servant? Who's unhealed? I'll tell you, some of the, no, I won't say some. The greatest manifestation of unhealedness in the earth right now is the body of Christ. And I'll say this much, because there it's it's being healed in the, some major revivals in Iran and China and, and Africa, but I'll tell you this, an unhealed American church is what I see. And wounded people wound others. Hurt people hurt others. And all the nonsense on Facebook and the political nonsense and the anger that the church is unleashing on each other, the Lord is saying, behold my American church. And what are you saying? What are we to behold? Why do you insist on being battered? Why do you continue to rebel? Your head has a massive wound. Your whole body is weak. From the soles of your feet to your head, there is no spot that is unharmed. There are only bruises, cuts, and open wounds. May I raise up my apostolic leaders to cleanse, bandage, and treat with olive oil. See, that's the impartation that Paul's talking about. The Lord is making me one who, in my apostolic ministry as the servant of the Lord, who imparts what is lacking in the church, what is lacking in the body from the suffering of Christ in Jesus' name. All right, let's finish up. Isaiah 49. I don't think we're going to get to Isaiah 50, but that's okay. We'll, we'll finish up with Isaiah 49. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. See? The Greeks, the nations of the earth. Again, he's, he's calling everybody into healing. See, and we're wounded healers. See, as the Lord heals the church, the church can go out and heal the nations. I mean, that's just, this, is, this is what God's calling us to as being part of the 
impartational and intercessorial ministry of the servant of the Lord. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. Now see again, first the voice that says, Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. At this point, the servant is the voice that's speaking. Yahweh starts and speaks about the servant in Isaiah 42. Now the servant moves into the second phase of his ministry. And the second phase of his ministry, now he calls out. Just as his father spoke for the nations and the coastlands to gather together in the heavenly courtroom. See, the son sees what the father's doing and hears what the father's saying and does and says what the father is doing and saying. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Now notice, in this second aspect of of the ministry of the servant, there's going to be increased warfare. We, we saw justice in the first servant song, Isaiah 42. We're going to see warfare to establish the mission of the Lord in the second service song, servant song. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. See that, that hiddenness of the ministry of Jesus. He is the weapon of the Lord, and those of us in leadership are to be the weapon of the Lord, but we're, it's a hidden weapon. It's not a weapon, again, that's just going to come out and lop off the heads of all of the enemies of the Lord. It's a hidden warfare. It's warfare to set people free. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified, in whom I will reveal my beautiful splendor. That's not the Hebrew word. Let me, let me um, double check it in the Hebrew here. Uh, yes, that's not kavod. That's not the, the glory of the Lord being manifested. That's the beauty of the Lord. See, the, the glory dimension of the Lord has several aspects. There's the, he's high and lifted up. We fall at his feet as dead. We, we say that I'm a, a, a man of unclean lips who dwell among a people of unclean lips. That's a dimension of God's glory. There's a dimension of God's glory that reveals his person, that he's the, he's the uh, Yahweh, 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 as, as he declares to Moses in Exodus 34, st- showing steadfast love and faithfulness and pardoning iniquity and forgiving sin, but still holding the guilty accountable. I mean, there's a, a revelatory realm of glory. There's a fear of the Lord realm of glory. Well, this is the beauty realm of the Lord. This is when we see the beauty of the Lord. You're going to do warfare uh, that, it, that is the, what, when my beauty is being hindered from being revealed in the earth by idolatry, by sin, by darkness, by the devil, and by the poor testimony, the failure of the testimony of God's people. Uh, That's the warfare that I'm going to do. I'm going to make warfare so the mission of the Lord to reveal his beauty and his splendor is manifested in the earth. And notice, the servant himself says that the Lord said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I am glorified, in whom this beauty realm will be revealed. Now the servant isn't Israel. This is a separate figure. This is Jesus. But notice, he calls Israel the servant out of his own mouth because it's the identity of the Lord and the identity of his people are bound together. They're so closely intertwined. That's why we are the body of Christ. Jesus would have gotten the the understanding here that Paul translated into calling the church the body of Christ, one of the many images that we see of of the church in scripture, the body of Christ. It's that he's the head, we're the body. Our our histories are intermingled. Our, Our destinies are intertwined. Our identities are one. And God is going to use the servant and the people who are raised up in the image of the servant 
to reveal the beauty realm of the Lord. And this is where warfare is. And notice, see, you, you want to understand when you as a leader are under warfare, when you as a father are under warfare, when you as a parent are under warfare, where you as, as, as anyone, a ministry leader is under warfare. Warfare is this, but I have said, the servant says this, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Vanity is just meaninglessness. Everything I've done, it's meant nothing. See, that's warfare. See, and, and, and as leaders, that's where we have to press through. That's where we have to fill up what is lacking in the body of Christ. See, when, when you feel like giving up, that's when you need to press through, not for you, but for all those under you. By pressing through, you will release the supply and the impartation for the rest of the church to press through as you pray for them, as you proclaim the gospel for them, as you model for them, as you teach them to give thanks and be thankful. Yet surely, and here's interesting, yet surely my justice is with the Lord. See, the servant himself needs justice. The servant is going to bring justice, but the servant himself needs the justice of the Lord. He needs the vindication of the Lord. And my recompense is with my God. The fruit of my labors are manifested. So now the Lord speaks. The servant, in the midst of warfare, finds himself fatigued. He finds himself wondering if... if is, 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 is what God called me to do going to be fulfilled? See, that, that's been the thing that, if there's been one thing that has uh, uh, been, uh, we'll call it plagued me as a leader, it's, it's looking around and saying, is, is anything that I'm doing worthwhile? As a leader, as a father, as a husband, as a co-laborer in the gospel, as a member of an apostolic team in the gospel, does, is anything worthwhile? This is our warfare. This is our battle. Looking around and saying, I haven't I'm 69 years old and I haven't fulfilled the purposes of the Lord. But then the Lord speaks. Notice, though the servant says, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. There's always the word. That's not a word of unbelief. That's just a word of reality that we're going to face times of warfare like that. And then, But the servant adds, faith and hope to that reality. Yet surely my justice is with the Lord. If the Lord's calling me to establish justice, well then I'm going to receive justice from the Lord as well. And the Lord is going to give me fruit for my labors. And then at that point, Yahweh himself speaks. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. Israel's going to be gathered. Israel's going to be brought back to him. But that's not all. The mission isn't just going to be about the church and the people of God. The mission goes beyond the four walls of the church. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. See, the Lord, it's interesting. The Lord will honor those who honor him. The Lord will honor those who honor his purposes. The Lord will honor him who persevere through all circumstances. Perseverance equals apostolic reality because the honor of the Lord is drawn. You know, we, we've, been, we've been talking about revival lately. What are some of the things God is drawn to? And he's drawn to honor He's drawn to prayer. He's drawn to uh, brokenness. Well, he's also drawn to perseverance. For I am honored in the eyes of my Lord, and my God has become my strength. And he says to me, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant simply to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back those who are preserved in Israel, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And then the, the second servant song closes with these words. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One. We said Isaiah is going to define who the Holy One is. Well, the Holy One is the Redeemer, the one who purchase, purchases 
back his enslaved king kinsmen who are slaves to debt. He pays their debt. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One redeems his people. He'll, he'll pay their debt and get them out of debt. To one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations. The Holy One intervenes when his people are despised and when his people are abhorred. And this is how he intervenes. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. He's faithful. means if he's promised it, he's going to bring it to pass. And finally, who has chosen you? Servant of the Lord, you've been chosen. People of God, you've been chosen. Leaders, you've been chosen to be servants. You've been chosen because he's faithful, because he will fulfill his word. And so in the second servant song, the servant is encouraged in his mission of warfare to reveal the beauty of the Lord. How might you reveal the beauty of the Lord? Well, when the beauty of the Lord is revealed to you, you'll be able to reveal the beauty of the Lord. When you're healed, you'll be able to be a healer. When you're redeemed and set free from your debt, your debts are canceled, you'll be able to assist others to get their debts canceled. When you receive your inheritance, you'll be able to bring others into their inheritance. Lord, we thank you, Father. We are talking about building the Father's house here, Lord, through impartation, through looking to you, Lord, through having your, your powerful work work in our lives, Lord. I just pray, Lord, you prepare us this week even more to continue to build the Father's house, Lord. If, if the only thing that's been coming forth from these messages that I've been given since Colossians 1 began, Lord. These are prophetic messages. These are apostolic messages. Let the leadership in this house, Lord, see how we're going to be prepared to build the Father's house. Let us see how we can impart to our brothers and sisters everything they need to participate in building the Father's house so we can impart wisdom and maturity and the revelation of Jesus Christ so we can assist you in the hope of glory, Jesus Christ being revealed in our midst. Thank you, Father. Next week, Lord, when Reggie comes with this word of building the Father's house, let this outside apostolic ministry add something. May it impart something to us that we don't have and that we need to continue to build the Father's house. And in the meantime, in this next week, help us to build the Father's house. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.